Okay, um, I think we'll get started and hopefully by the end of my introductions, we'll have a few more people joining us. So I'm Dave Block and uh, Anita Oberholster is, at least on my screen, is in the box just below me. Um, and so welcome to Office Hours with Dave and Anita. Uh, this, this week we have a great program for you focused on uh, converting vineyards to uh, mechanization and also uh, if you have a, a need to mothball vineyard we have two experts with us today that will um, give you a chance to ask questions on the best way to do that. Um, so we have two visitors today. Uh, one of them is Con Curderall. Con is the extension specialist in viticulture in the department based at the Oakville Experimental Station. I don't know where he is on your screen, but for me, he's right over there. And um, I'm next to Karen. And Con <laughs> has done a, a bunch of work on um, mechanization and automation in the vineyard um, and has put in a, a no touch vineyard block at, uh, uh, at our Oakville facility in addition to um, all throughout the state working on mechanization of vineyard blocks that were designed for that and ones that weren't. Um, our other guest, who for me is kind of in that direction <laughs> on my screen, is Larry Bettega. It's, we're very lucky to have Larry with us today. He's uh, been with UC, with UC for over 40 years and uh, farm advisor, viticulture farm advisor for a, uh, a big portion of that. He's the farm, viticulture farm, farm advisor for Monterey County, uh, Santa Cruz County and San Benito counties. Um, and an expert in everything from viticultural practices through clonal um, selections and things like that. Uh, and a big part of why that area of California is such an important grape growing region for the state and the country. And so with that, I think um, our plan is to have both of them talk for probably about 10 minutes or so, um, each to give you kind of an introduction and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, and we have some questions too. Uh, and if you have questions, you haven't joined us, you can open the participant tab and hit raise hand if you want to, or show your video and wave your hand around and we'll see you, or just speak up, unmute yourself and speak up. Um, oh, or you can also just open up the chat um, and chat, put something in chat and uh, Anita, or I will actually read your question to, to Larry and Khan. So with that, I'm not sure which one of you is, is talking first. Con, are you talking first? Yeah, uh, I'll go uh, first and turn it over to uh, Larry. Okay, so Con, you have 10 minutes. All right. Uh, I'm kind of leaving your hands around. Okay, let me uh, see. <laughs> okay, um, well, we've been uh, getting a steady stream of uh, questions on uh, canopy and crop load uh, management in a tough market. And uh, uh, these are some of the uh, questions that uh, we're getting. Uh, the market is uh, somewhat uh, contracting. People have uh, difficulty, uh, you know, moving uh, fruit. Uh, the spot sales have uh, somewhat uh, are in a uh, limbo, and of course, uh, there are also uh, COVID-related uh, issues of uh, getting uh, laborers uh, to and uh, from vineyards, uh, you know, farm labor contractor vans. But we also have the uh, increasing sales of uh, case goods at uh, you know our regular uh, points of uh, sale. So these are, the, uh, these are some of the questions I'm getting. Uh, Larry uh, will, uh, of course, uh, delve into it uh, as well from our coastal uh, regions too. Uh, they're asking me, uh, how do I uh, reduce my uh, exposure to uh, volatile uh, labor markets? What are the uh, minimum practices I can do on uh, what kind of uh, trellises? What kind of uh, practices I can do uh, mechanically? Or what kind of uh, trellises? And then, uh, unfortunately, I keep uh, getting this uh, question, uh, not just from uh, California, also from our uh, neighboring states. Uh, how do I mothball uh, vineyards and uh, what I should do uh, with the uh, fruit, if uh, anything? Uh, of course, uh, we can do uh, lots of things uh, mechanically. Uh, I mainly, uh, well, I only uh, work with uh, wine grapes. Uh, essentially, all of them are uh, mechanically uh, picked at about 90% uh, of the uh, acreage in uh, California as a whole. We can uh, prune them by machine. Uh, as far as uh, canopy management, leaf removal and uh, shoot thinning can be done. And some uh, crop 
load uh, management can be done by uh, machines. Uh, looking at our uh, trellises we have, uh, most common ones that we have are the uh, California sprawl. These adapt to our mechanization. Pre-pruning and our final pruning can be done, but with some difficulty, shoot thinning can be done. Uh, they are uh, harvested uh, very easily and uh, trunk suckering can be done. But I'll mostly uh, talk about a uh, single high wire and uh, uh, quadrilateral uh, systems today. Uh, these are low input but uh, high production systems, meaning that uh, not a whole lot of our uh, practices have to be done on these other than uh, pruning and maybe one uh, canopy management pass. And uh, this canopy management pass is usually a leaf removal uh, practice. So these are the uh, low input, high production systems uh, as people are uh, converting their systems. Uh, most head trained uh, guys that we have uh, worked with have uh, converted to a single high wire system. These can be uh, up to uh, 66 inches tall in our vineyards if the uh, rows are uh, spread far apart. This is a single canopy bilateral cordon train system. High quad is a little bit uh, more uh, advanced. It's a split canopy. There's a catch wire at uh, 66 inches above vineyard floor. The first cross arm can be uh, 18 to uh, 24 inches wide. And the uh, cross arm uh, uh, on top can be 32 to uh, 48 inches wide, which is about a foot above the uh, uh, canopy layer. Uh, some production statistics based on our uh, knowledge uh, so far uh, about 35% of our exposed leaf area with the single high wire, 70% exposed leaf area with the uh, high quad. We can get into production in about uh, 18 months if we're using our uh, tall vines. Seven by 10 uh, density, 11 to 24 tons to the acre. Uh, 11 foot uh, plant density, six by 11. 14 to uh, 32 tons to the acre in the uh, high quad uh, systems. Of course, uh, balancing a uh, uh, crop load uh, and uh, uh, a leaf air to fruit ratio in these things uh, can be challenging because uh, these are uh, you know very productive. Uh, it becomes a uh, you know uh, an arduous task. However, uh, whether you use a uh, leaf air to a uh, crop weight or a uh, crop weight to a uh, pruning weight ratio, they are uh, perfectly uh, related to uh, each other. But the goal is to reach uh, an uh, acceptable uh, amount of uh, total soluble solids uh, in these to make the uh, secondary plant uh, compounds. So we can reach these uh, very well. But yields in grapevine are uh, difficult. Uh, removing fruit, uh, retaining fruit is always a challenge. But uh, in our uh, current uh, production system, if we were to uh, approach the uh, 5 to 10 uh, crop load uh, ratio, we are usually going to be under the uh, economic uh, threshold which is roughly around like a 12 tons to the acre, uh, you know, statewide. So when we look at our minimum practices for mothballing, the main thing is to keep uh, and maintain a healthy leaf area. Most guys uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, mothballing vineyards, they have box pruned their uh, vineyards. It's the cheapest thing that they can do. What we're recommending them is the, the cover sprays have to be, uh, you know, put on at least with a uh, sulfur. Uh, we're uh, saying uh, at least a uh, half an acre foot in inland valleys uh, of uh, irrigation will be needed. And uh, the other common, common question we get is, uh, do I need to remove the fruit? Fruit does not need to be uh, picked or uh, removed because the effect on our root reserves is uh, minimal. The leaf area is what determines our root reserves for uh, upcoming years. If you want to uh, uh, fruit this vineyard, uh, you should be uh, fine without removing the uh, fruit. And we had uh, done this work uh, earlier, uh, last three years at uh, Oakville Station, actually. So uh, we were unfortunately uh, prepared for uh, this kind of uh, question. The response of our uh, grapevine to our retaining fruit, as I mentioned, the healthy leaf areas are more important to uh, minimize the adverse uh, results exactly. to mothballing. Uh, it'll take at least two years for our root and shoot mass to be affected by our mothballing. So you have this uh, two-year uh, uh, window to, uh, you know, uh, slow down the, uh, you know, production. Uh -huh. Retaining or uh, leaving our fruit on the vine uh, has essentially uh, no physiological impact uh, at this uh, point. Uh, other uh, things uh, that we see is a uh, shift towards uh, non-positioned uh, conduction systems. Uh, these can be, uh, you know, uh, detrimental. And uh, I don't know who's uh, talking. I cannot, you know. Uh, these can be uh, detrimental uh, in our uh, hot climates, depending on the uh, row orientation. 
and uh, anthocyanin uh, flavonal uh, biosynthesis under uh, minimum management uh, should not be uh, that big of an uh, issue as uh, you know, we will certainly uh, degrade them if we were to uh, open them up uh, later on in the uh, season to uh, get into uh, production. Uh, of course, uh, green flavor uh, degradation under uh, minimal management in our warm regions of uh, California is not that big of a deal because uh, a lot of the uh, methoxypyrazines, especially with uh, red wine grapes, uh, will degrade uh, as the uh, uh, season wears on. So that's all I have. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Larry uh, and I'll stop my share. Uh, let me see. And go from there. Thanks, John. Yeah. Larry, so do you know how to share your screen? Just click on the green button at the bottom that says share screen and then choose desktop and share. And you can just call up your, there you go. Perfect. Larry, you're still muted. Okay, press the rewind button. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. That's good. Thank you. I just wanted to review a little bit about some of the work that we've done in the past. And again, there's been a big change in, in uh, trellis systems used in California and also canopy management practices. And again, uh, there was a time when everything was very similar and we had wide rows, wide spacings and mostly non-positioned canopies. And it's not to say that that's a bad system for, uh, for moderate to low vigor sites. Uh, it can, can actually produce very nice fruit. It's maybe not the most uh, efficient from an area use and, and better production can be achieved by putting the rows closer together and sometimes the vines closer together. But again, it, it was somewhat problematic because on high vigor sites, there was an excess of uh, vigor and uh, very shaded uh, fruit zones. And so it led, you know, it, it led to uh, issues with quality and, and also productivity because of those shaded conditions. And so again, especially in the 80s uh, and 90s, we saw, especially I think it was uh, promoted also by the fact that we had to replant a lot of vineyards in California due to phylloxera infections. We did see a very rapid movement uh, to other trellis systems and a lot of those were the VSP types, which were fine and low to moderate vigor sites. But again, with high vigor, there was a lot of shading, a lot of compaction of that canopy as you put it in a vertical plane. And it probably is not the most ideal uh, trellis system for high vigor sites. Uh, maybe more appropriate is some type of horizontal split. Or if you want to be in a vertical system, we did look at some of these uh, vertical splits, such as the uh, Scott Henry and the uh, the Dyson systems, and again, especially in high vigor, higher vigor sites compared to the VSP, our results showed that we got uh, much better uh, light environment in the fruit zone, and uh, along with that came usually increased productivity. Again, uh, we looked at these systems. There was some concern at the time whether these two tiers would ripen differently. And in our work, uh, sometimes initially there there is a difference, but Typically over time, there's higher productivity on this top tier versus the lower tier. And if you look at that fruit at, at harvest time, oftentimes there's a very minimal difference in, in, in uh, ripening between those upper tiers, as long as you have grown adequate canopy and that canopy is exposed. And again, I think con covered, uh, we're seeing a lot, even in the coastal areas now is the conversion to uh, to the high wire system. Again, people are looking for uh, increased mechanization with the concern that there's a lack of labor out there. And again, we've had uh, quite a few vineyards go into that system and, and especially for production vineyards where people are looking for uh, high production uh, and that fruit at a lower price point, uh, that system seems to be working quite well. And so we've seen a lot of, uh, even on low to moderate vigor sites, we've seen this system go into place and uh, it appears at this point to be working quite well.
How do I, uh, I guess maybe here, here. Again, uh, the VSP uh, is, is almost become somewhat, especially in the coastal areas, it was the kind of the standard. Maybe we're seeing a little bit of shift now to uh, high wire systems. As you go into the Central Valley, there's still, and even in some of the coastal areas, we still have some sprawl systems. And again, in some of our work where we did comparative uh, work on, on a site, uh, especially under low to moderate vigorous uh, conditions, Oftentimes, some, it, there are cases where this sprawl system can actually give you a better light uh, regime within the fruit zone than the VSP because you get somewhat spreading of that canopy and get a very nice dappled light environment in there. And so again, uh, under the right conditions, is still a viable system. Uh, it re again requires maybe a little bit further spacing of the rows to avoid any congestion in the middles. But again, uh, we still have vineyards uh, in California, in the coastal and in the valley, Central Valley, that can, can grow nice quality fruit uh, with these sprawl type systems. Again, we did look at these uh, Dyson, Smart Dyson and Scott Henry, and also the, what we call the Smart Henry, which is, the, uh, is on a cordon system versus a Scott Henry, which is a cane system. And again, we did see improvements in productivity, improvements in wine quality as far as a reduction in vegetative characters, especially in, in, in red wines. And again, a lot of that was uh, due to the increased uh, light environment within the, within, the, um, within the fruit zone. Again, uh, I have to remind people that uh, this is a coastal vineyard. This actually is up on the north coast in the Napa Valley, and uh, this was taken sometime in the 80s. And again, there were there are very high vigor soils in there where you, with a lot of water uh, retention in those soils, you get excessive vigor. And again, uh, I, I I don't think anybody would call this an ideal situation, but I think with adequate management practices and uh, different trellis systems, we've been able to take these sites and, 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 and kind of moderate that shoot growth with, uh, with a combination of canopy management, vineyard design, and, and it improved uh, maybe the potential wines that came off of some of these sites. I mean, there are other sites. This is also on the North Coast. This is a Cabernet vineyard on a kind of a moderate to low vigor site. And again, this is a, 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 a non-position canopy, uh, Cabernet with its upright growth, uh, uh, it can produce very nice fruit uh, with a, with a non-position canopy. So that's not to say that uh, uh, even back in the 80s on the sites like this, uh, this is actually an older photo, um, produced relatively uh, uh, nice fruit. And again, you look at that, that canopy, you can see uh, the majority of the, the clusters and there's dappled light within that canopy, it, it's pretty much an ideal type situation. Again, uh, this is a, another coastal vineyard. And again, as we went to VSPs, obviously we had the ability to put rows closer together. These are actually two vin adjacent vineyards that are separated by an avenue of different owners. One had, uh, had, had converted this to VSP. Uh, the other, it's still a sprawl canopy. Uh, they both have potential of producing pretty nice fruit. Sometimes the practices are a little different, uh, but that's not to say that uh, under the right set of conditions, they can't both produce uh, quality fruit. Uh, their practices are somewhat different. Uh, here are the same two vineyards. You see the one in the, uh, the upper left-hand side is the VSP that is probably has more uh, uh, labor inputs. So this is a canopy that's been shoot thinned as uh, leaf removal on the uh, on the east side of the canopy. These are north-south rows. And again, you see nice exposure of that fruit. Uh, this is a very cool site. So they're actually looking for uh, exposure and some warmth uh, on those clusters to uh, reduce some of the uh, acidity that's retained in this fruit. So this is a site that uh, they want exposure uh, because they are trying to, uh, to uh, they have a common, commonly in some of these sites, you have uh, relatively high sugar, but can retain a lot of acidity. So they're looking for uh, some respiration of that acidity with uh, that exposure. Again, the canopy on the, on the bottom right is also uh, Chardonnay. Um, 
probably less input in this one, uh, very probably minimal shoot thinning, but there is some leaf removal. And again, you can see with a little bit of leaf removal, again, you see pretty good fruit exposure. And uh, again, uh, both these could have the potential of, of, of producing a nice quality Chardonnay. Again, here's a, a, another site, VSP, maybe not the most appropriate because it's a high vigor site. And so this is a picture taken uh, in the Napa Valley. And this is uh, probably around this time of year. It's uh, right after fruit set. And again, this is the same vineyard before and after a, a hedging pass. And so again, with the VSP and then also a tight row spacing, uh, there's a lot of vigor, a shoot vigor in these, in these, in these vines. And again, it's not to say you can't produce a uh, good quality, it takes more management. So again, there's a lot of hedging, a lot of leaf removal that has to go in, into this uh, to open up those canopies to get some sunlight in there and, and, and reduce maybe some of the negative impacts that that shading can cause. Possibly this would be a site that maybe a different type of trellis system uh, and maybe a different uh, design itself as far as spacing would uh, moderate some of that shoot growth and maybe minimize some of the inputs you'd have to put in to produce quality. And again, of course, we've, we, we, the, 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 the VSP system, uh, one of the problems is you get into warmer areas. Uh, it does expose the fruit uh, and again, uh, Sometimes uh, overheating that fruit have caused some both sunburn as far as a loss of crop, but also then maybe some negative consequences to both color development and then fruit flavors. And so again, people have modified some of these trellis systems to put in different cross arm configurations, sometimes to let some of that canopy droop on the west or the more, more exposed side of the canopy that gets the afternoon sun to can moderate some of those temperatures. And again, people have also, this is a one that's, that can work quite well uh, in a hot area to give a little bit more shade and protection to that fruit to the uh, negative consequences of maybe overexposure to the afternoon sun. Again, here's a good example of that. This is actually a vineyard up in the Sierra foothills uh, with, the, with two cross arms. And again, this is not really a position canopy. A lot of those, this is Cabernet also. And, and again, those uh, shoots are caught by those wires. Maybe a little bit of uh, uh, positioning is required to keep it all tucked in. But again, you see that fruit, and this is a picture in the afternoon. It's got some protection from the sun. And uh, again, uh, that protection is gonna hopefully prevent sunburn and maybe a reduction in color uh, that might be if that fruit was totally exposed. Again, this is a picture at the Oakvale station. I think uh, Con just showed a picture of this, but again, some of these multiple cross arm systems, this one has the ability to rake the shoots and, and, and position them. And so here you see this uh, center being open and getting some light in there, but then that fruit is, uh, is, is somewhat protected by the, uh, the, the configuration of those shoots. And so again, another way of uh, maybe using a, a somewhat of a modified kind of a VSP approach to, uh, to get the upright growth, but, uh, but also to protect that fruit from the negative consequences of uh, the heat and sun in warmer climates. Again, as we talk about, and, and Con touched on some of this as we're concerned about mothballing vineyards, uh, you know, there's a lot of these uh, canopy management practices that maybe you, you don't want to apply because you're trying to minimize cost, costs. Again, uh, when it comes to crop regulation, uh, maybe pruning is your best practice. So more severe pruning will eliminate at least some of the crop load. And uh, maybe you're, these are the years you're going to minimize some of the shoot thinning, or hopefully maybe you can get some of these machines in to uh, least mechanize that thinning to reduce uh, the cost that would be normally associated with either shoot thinning or, or, or leaf removal. And again, the cluster removal, uh, if you do the pruning, maybe, maybe you just leave the fruit on there. Maybe it gets sold, maybe it doesn't, but uh, maybe at least minimize some of that crop load to at least avoid of a, a overcrop uh, situation if you're going to cut back some of these other um, inputs as far as water and, and other maybe nutrients. And so you don't want to get yourself, like Khan said, you want to make sure at least the canopies are healthy, 
And, and, and if the canopies are healthy, we've seen many of these vineyards uh, mothballed and uh, being brought back uh, when, when things uh, you know, improve. And again, uh, the, the, the other thing would be to really think about this, uh, this crop dropping, um, probably not necessary for a mothballed vineyard, but again, if you're producing fruit, uh, it, it's it's one of these times uh, when you know that fruit has to be. If you're on the open market, people are looking for good fruit, and so you have to make that decision: Are you going to put the inputs in to, to to have that fruit that someone's going to want, or are you just going to let it go? And so I think you have to make that decision early because it, you, you can't do both. And so when there's too much uh, fruit on the market, uh, even this last year, we we people had to clean up things. We had some disease problems last year. And so a lot of those fields had to be cleaned up to, to sell that crop uh, because of either botrytis or, or maybe mildew. And so again, some, sometimes it, at the minimum, you're gonna have to do some selective removal of defective clusters to at least uh, optimize that crop to hopefully get it sold this year. So with that, I'll stop and I guess I'll we'll open it up for, for questions. Thanks, Larry. Um, if let's see, hit the uh, how do I? Here we go. Um, so I, I do have one question in chat. I'll remind you at this point. Um, if you have questions, you can uh, in the participant panel. You can click the raise your hand or type something in chat or uh, just unmute yourself uh, when we come to the end of a question. Um, this, this is a question, uh, what, what would be a recommended yield target for a Cab so Cabernet Sauvignon uh, vineyard on a high wire in Napa? What's the re recommended between row distance for the high wire and does it work for all varieties? Oh, Ooh, you're muted. I'm always muted. Um, uh, our uh, experience with the uh, single high wire in uh, Napa, we're in our uh, fourth year now. Um, so we settled at uh, uh, 8.7 tons to the uh, acre uh, there at uh, 1,340 vines uh, to the acre uh, at that uh, density. So that's uh, six by five, roughly. Um, Recommended uh, spacing on it uh, will depend on uh, what kind of uh, machine will uh, pick this because you're not going to pick a mechanically uh, pruned canopy uh, by hand unless you have a uh, graduate students. Um, so uh, depends uh, if the uh, harvester has uh, onboard uh, bins or if you're going to follow it with a gondola. Um, uh, so if you're going to follow it with a gondola, the uh, a minimum spacing is going to be at nine and a half feet uh, between our uh, rows to have the uh, gondola fit. Um, other than that, I mean, uh, single high wires are uh, fairly uh, straight uh, forward. And uh, when we had developed uh, this site, uh, our cost was roughly about uh, $13,500 an acre. Uh, that included uh, irrigation uh, set up uh, in there. So uh, at uh, 8.7, 8 8.9 tons to the acre, our uh, Ravaz index at uh, Oakville Station is exactly at uh, eight. So we're, it's not a, uh, you know, we could probably do uh, more yield, but uh, I don't know where we would uh, put the uh, fruit. So anyways, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and and Khan, uh, there's also a question of, is this gonna work for all varieties? Uh, we haven't had any uh, problems with uh, varieties. Uh, some people were saying uh, it's very difficult to uh, mechanize uh, Zinfandel Pinot Gris, but uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, experience with uh, Pinot Gris and uh, Zinfandel, so it has uh, worked well for them. But uh, the, uh, if the uh, varieties have an upright growth habit, we have a uh, better luck with them. Uh, if they're uh, flopping varieties, they do need uh, some uh, shoot removal uh, early in the uh, season, so that will add another uh, Canopy management uh, pass, which is roughly about uh, eighty-three to a hundred dollars an uh, acre cost. Con, oh, sorry, question. No, for go you. ahead, please go, go ahead. ahead. Um, actually, a few things. 
first, uh, a, a six foot row with, don't you have canopy closure in a high wire setup? I mean, doesn't your canopy grow too densely? Don't you want to have longer shoots than you're able to have without, I mean, how are you able to penetrate the vine rows? Uh, well, I mean, as, as the uh, crop uh, uh, ripens on there, uh, the, uh, it's a sprawl, so it uh, pulls the uh, weight of the uh, shoots down and uh, those shoots uh, grow down. The shoots don't cross? No, we haven't had, I mean, uh, if you uh, manage your uh, irrigation uh, correctly, uh, they don't. So uh, here we have not uh, gone over a point for an acre feet at uh, Oakville of uh, applied uh, water at our uh, location. And that is uh, with a sustained uh, deficit of a uh, negative 12 uh, stem water potential. And uh, we're still able to get, uh, you know, uh, eight to uh, uh, nine tons of uh, yield. So at a six foot uh, spacing, nine shoot position canopy with the uh, load on it. So that pulls it and the uh, center of the canopy are uh, open. So uh, the goal is to get about a uh, five and a half feet of uh, shoot growth uh, on these to uh, feed the uh, fruit. So it has uh, worked uh, quite well uh, for us, so. Um, and, and then, uh, thank you, following up on that. Um, are you guys looking at the risk of canopy roll at all? Um, do you think a roll wire is necessary or do you think it, it's effective if you wrap the cane on a harder, you know, tissue varietal like Cabernet? Yeah, so the question is, uh, are we worried about a uh, canopy roll? And uh, that was the question uh, Larry Bettega asked me uh, seven years ago in uh, Fresno. <laughs> Uh, we wrap the uh, cane uh, just uh, one twist on uh, each side, then I'll uh, lay it down. Uh, with that, uh, we have not uh, had the uh, canopy uh, roll. But uh, I mean, uh, if you add the uh, roll wire, that complicates a lot of things uh, in these uh, mechanized systems because you want to move in uh, out of there uh, pretty fast, uh, whether with a you know a rotary cutter or uh, with a saw cutter. But a uh, roll wire uh, complicates a lot of things. Just Wrapping the uh, core down uh, once is uh, like sufficient enough. And then are you trying to train the majority of your spurs up? Uh, so are you? Yeah, yeah well, we try, we uh, uh, train the uh, spurs uh, upward, uh, but the uh, implement uh, we have been uh, using uh, has the uh, undercutters as well. So uh, underside of the uh, canopy is uh, essentially a uh, blind. So uh, we don't have any uh, hangers uh, under the uh, cordons. And then, Lastly, are you looking at any mechanical suckering or shoot thinning devices at this point? Or? Yeah, I mean, uh, we did that uh, work a lot. So uh, on June 4th, uh, we will uh, mechanically uh, thin the uh, canopy here at uh, Oakville. So we can do them both on a single high wire VSPs and uh, also on our quad canopies uh, now as well. Uh, I mean, some of the guys on the Central Coast, like uh, uh, Mesa Vineyard Management, uh, they use these uh, implements, uh, they run them uh, uh, quite well. Uh, they're going uh, a lot faster than uh, we are, like four or five miles an hour. I'm not that brave. <laughs> are you using the Oxbow like they are, or what, what tool are you using? Uh, VMAC, uh, Oxbow has uh, gone out of this. Uh, uh, VMAC. Yeah, 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 we're using uh, VMAC. Uh, that has uh, worked uh, quite well uh, for us. So. Got it. Are you experimenting with that at all in cane prune vineyards, just out of curiosity? Uh, cane pruned uh, vineyards, uh, we did uh, a lot of uh, leaf removal. Uh, in our uh, cane pruned uh, vineyards in uh, 2011 and uh, 2012, uh, we ran a uh, shoot removal in our uh, cane pruned vineyards in uh, Syrah and uh, Kern County. It works, but uh, you know, uh, you know, it's not uh, as uniform as uh, you know our cordon trained uh, vineyard uh, in the end. But I mean, it doesn't look as pretty it just looks like a bad hand job thank you okay so i have a follow-up question so khan in your experience because you have done a lot of um mechanically managing vineyards have you noticed a difference in the quality between mechanically managed vineyards and those that are hand managed and then larry i'm going to ask exactly the same question after khan has answered uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, chemically, uh, we cannot tell a difference and, uh, taste wise, uh, we cannot tell a difference. And, uh, when we did the, uh, you know, uh, tastings, uh, with these things, 
no one can tell the uh, difference until we tell them what it is. Then they say like, ah, oh, yeah, of course, this tastes a lot more greener. But uh, that has been my experience the last uh, 15 years. So. Okay. Larry? Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, th there's two things. There's, I mean, I've seen some of the stuff go to uh, the high wire box prune system, and it does produce more. And so, but if it's it, if you're comparing vineyards at similar crop loads, there's very little difference in quality. And so, I think especially now, and we saw that years ago, even with some of the other box pruned, uh, mechanically pruned vines, uh, you know, quality was actually pretty good. Uh, there was always still hesitation at the time. This I'm talking probably the mid to late '80s, but you know, once people made wines from those. It, it, again, if, if you're comparing vineyards with similar crop loads, uh, uh, if you have the canopy to support it, the quality is there. So I think, uh, and, and I think now the tools are better. And yeah. so some of the, 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 the tools we have as far as for, for shoot thinning and for leaf removal are much better than what we did when we did some of the early trials in the 80s and 90s. And so uh, I think if you put a, the whole package together, I think it has a potential of producing equal quality fruit. Okay. Yes, and I mean, in previous year, there, I assume there was also a little bit more damage to the vine itself, which was something to consider as well. Right. Okay. So, Al, did you have a question? Go ahead and you have no, to unmute. unmute yourself. Uh, we could probably do that for you. Let's see. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I have a uh, eight-year-old Syrah vineyard that I planted myself in my front yard. It's uh, about 80 vines. It's uh, bilateral cordons, VSB trellis. And I had a problem when I was pruning, probably years four through seven, and I kept letting the spurs get taller and taller. Um, so now I have shoots coming out of the top of the spurs that are very, very productive. And But I was trying to also regrow some bottom spurs which are much less productive. And I'm thinking maybe I should just not cut the spurs back, but uh, just let it not get any higher than it is now because it's very productive. But right now, I mean, it, it takes me three hours to prune and leaf pull one side of the each row. And there's only like 15 to 11 vines in each row. Do you recommend that I just let let the spurs stay up high and, and just use those top productive uh, canes. Yeah, the problem now is if you cut everything back, you, you will lose a lot of productivity, but you can do it gradually sometimes. And when the opportunity yeah. arises, you can start, you know, reducing the height of some of those positions. Ideally, you prune in a way where you, 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 you don't get those very long. Uh, right, I, I wasn't doing it correctly. I didn't know I had to cut back closer to the cordon each year. Uh, but I, I think, and I'm getting like 850 pounds. I'm getting 10, 10 pounds of grapes per vine of pretty good quality. I'm a member of Cellar Masters Los Angeles and I've got some gold and silver medals out of it. So I think so I won't if you're, worry if you're hand picking that, it may not make a difference. If you're a machine picking it and you got those arms it, it, really long, it would be yeah, a point where it's all, it it's all hand all get broken off. So yeah. the machines will do it for you. Right. But ideally, I mean, you, you can lower those. It takes time, though. And yeah. You have to select the right, you know, spurs, and sometimes you have to do it in stages. Yeah, I understand. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I have another question in chat. Um, do you guys have any information on trunk disease incidents uh, in mechanically managed vineyards? No, well, we ideally. Do. Oh, go ahead. Colin. Go ahead. No, the cuts are smaller. I mean, you have more cuts, but the cuts are smaller. And so, you know, the, the great majority of our trunk disease comes from larger cuts. And so it's the cuts like we just talked about, like you get vines out of shape and you try to reposition some of those arms or, or shorten those arms. You make very large cuts. You really open yourself up to a lot of uh, trunk disease. And so I've seen certain varieties, uh, Syrahs, unfortunately, is one. Petite Syrah is another one where I've seen large cuts made, and uh, a few years later, those vines are just riddled with uh, canker disease. And so, but typically, I think there have been some studies showing that uh, 
with, with the smaller cuts, uh, you should have actually maybe less development of trunk disease over time with, with the, the, the box type systems. Yeah, that was the outcome of the uh, study uh, uh, from our USDA. They recommended uh, that uh, these areas that are prone to the, uh, you know, uh, pruning rains uh, actually uh, box prune their uh, vineyards uh, to avoid the uh, trunk disease uh, or their uh, incidence of trunk diseases. Al, did you have another question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I did have an incidence of trunk disease, a uh, trunk disease, a eukypa, eutypa, whatever it is. Uh, I actually removed one vine on the end of the row and, and autopsied it, and it, it was definitely trunk disease and it was spreading. Uh, most, it hasn't spread that much because most of the cuts I make are small, and then I, I'm a one-man show, but I go over it with Vitaseal to kind of seal those wounds. So some of them, the adjacent vines that look like they were going to exhibit more and more trunk disease have, have kind of come back on their own. That's all. I just wanted to throw that in. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I'll make a comment. So there's two interesting comments. If you can catch it early enough and before it goes down the trunk, you can retrain vines and eliminate the trunk diseases and, and have get, gain productivity. If people are concerned about or if they want to mothball vineyards, uh, this is a great opportunity to do some of that type of uh, cutting and retraining. Uh, granted, you're putting some more input into it, but you can eliminate, if you know you're not going to sell a crop, you can cut those uh, cordons off, retrain those vines, and within a year or two, you're back to full productivity. And so you, yes. you might actually eliminate, uh, you know, your, your trunk disease problem with uh, some, some retraining. Con, do you have a question? Hi, so um, question for both Con and Larry. Um, Con, the, the box train, the high single wire is at 68, in, 68 inches high. And I know that you're box cutting it, so it's not sprawling down. So is there a particular reason why it's set so high? And then, and then after you answer that, I was gonna ask Larry, I've heard it two different ways of setting the, um, the, the cordon higher. Um, one, to reduce heat exposure, reflected heat exposure from the ground in hotter areas. And then places like, I'm originally from Oregon, reducing or increasing airflow and reducing both frost or powdery mildew pressures by having it higher. So just really curious about raising the cord on, you know, the, the, the vine up higher away from the ground, if you could talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the uh, uh, cord on is high uh, to uh, generate a sufficient leaf area uh, to make a photosynthesis. Uh, if the cord on was uh, low, uh, as it's uh, on a VSP trellises, it would have to be a uh, support of that. The grapevine uh, does not make enough lignin uh, for the uh, shoots to be uh, erect by themselves. Uh, the more uh, wires you have, the more complicated it is to uh, mechanize. That's why the cordon is that high. Um, Larry uh, Berga had another uh, slide where he, comp where he uh, talks about the uh, distance between rows and the uh, height of the uh, canopy. So in our uh, situation at uh, six feet uh, uh, four inches, and uh, the canopy at uh, 66 uh, inches, we're still, uh, you know, uh, good uh, in our uh, uh, trellises uh, here, uh, as far as uh, light relations go. But uh, we did a lot of work on uh, uh, reflectance of uh, heat from uh, vineyard rows. It's not true. Uh, a lot of the uh, heat is uh, intercepted by the canopy. It doesn't uh, get get into the uh, clusters. So I don't know where you guys are getting that information. That work was uh, published in 2017. Larry, I think it's your turn. Yeah, I'm not sure I remember exactly all the things, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'll answer the one I know for sure. You know, as far as powdery mildew, there's no, the height of the canopy is not really going to have that much influence on, on the disease pressure. Um, that's more light 
related and and, uh, and 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 just openness. And so you could have low cordons and still be very open and yeah. you know reduce that potential issue. Um, and then as far as the height, I agree, you know, I agree with Connie. You know, that that height is is, is a function of of um, of getting enough canopy to to expose. And, but I have seen on lower vigor sites where those are don't necessarily have to be that high. And so right. you can reduce those as we've seen Riesling and Pinot Noir uh, go to uh, high wire, single wire. And some of those don't have to be, I, well, put it, they can be, but they don't necessarily have to be. If you have smaller, sh shorter shoots, yeah. uh, they don't need to be that high. But typically if you have that full canopy, that's where you're getting the productivity. So if you're getting shorter shoots, you also have potentially shorter or lower productivity of those canopies. Okay. And again, in California, I'd say, you know, generally we don't have, well, we have heat issues, but we don't have, I don't think there's anywhere where we need to put very low cordons. I've seen cordons as low as 18 inches. I know up in Oregon, they use a lot of very low cordons. There's some up on the North Coast too. I think we've come to the time where you got to think, what, what, are you, what are your advantages? And, and uh, to me, they, they're, they're, they're hard to work in. So you're asking, yeah. asking workers to bend over all day. And for me, I think that's a liability. And so I would I'd like to see a little higher cordon, even with VSP systems. We've also had issue, increased issues with uh, uh, animal predation on grapes. And so pigs, that, they love that 18 inches. They don't even have to work for that. They'll just go down the row and just chomp on fruit. And so that's the other thing you have to think about sometimes too, is yeah. you kind of open yourself up to other issues. And so I had a trial years ago, we had low cordon and high cordons. And I never got to pick that trial because the wild pigs get all low <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a question in chat, and Anita, I'm going to direct it to both. Anita, can I interrupt you for just a second? I saw the finger, yes. Uh, I just wanted to say before Anita asked this question from, from Lindsay, um, that I uh, just want to let you know that um, next week we uh, let you know that we have a we're going back to the winery side next week, and we're going to be talking about sustainable winery um, design and sustainable sustainable practices. We're very lucky to have the most sustainable winery in the world uh, here at UC Davis. I actually can see it a little bit behind me um, on the screen. Yeah. And the Jackson Sustainable Winery Building, which was built to be able to showcase uh, ideas in sustainable wine processing. And so next week we'll have um, Jill Brigham, Ron Runnebaum, Ned Spang, and I'll, I'll be there as well to talk about what's going on um, in the Jackson building and for winery sustainability in general. That's uh, next Tuesday, um, which is June 2nd. And the following Tuesday, June 9th, will be Beth Forrestal from our department. She's a, a new faculty member in the department, along with uh, Lauren Parker from the USDA Climate Hub and Martina Galliano, who's one of uh, Beth's students, talking about um, heat waves uh, and oh, that come along with climate change and how to deal with that in a vineyard, uh, as well as future varieties for California in the face of climate change. So that's on June 9th. So with that, sorry for the interruption, I'll turn it back to Anita to ask the next question. Okay, the next question to both Khan and Larry. How much cordon and trunk physical damage is acceptable as we increase more mechanical practices? Is there a time of year that is more ideal for suckering or shoot thinning, timing around rain, et cetera? So that's like a multi-level question right there. Um, if the trellises are set up correctly and are trained, uh, there should be uh, no damage, uh, I mean, at our uh, site in uh, Oakville and uh, the uh, uh, the Gallo uh, vineyards that we work with in uh, Sonoma, there's there has been uh, no damage because uh, they were uh, set up for this uh, purpose. Ideal time for uh, shoe removal by a uh, machine is when the uh, shoes are about uh, six to eight inches long. Uh, if you wait too long, uh, the uh, tendrils uh, will become uh, touch sensitive, start uh, uh, ro uh, you know uh, rolling into each other. You remove uh, more shoes than uh, you need to. Uh, but however, uh, 
shirt removal, uh, especially with uh, some of the varieties uh, we, we work, it's probably uh, not necessary in, uh, in California for uh, you know, production uh, purposes, because the more shoots uh, we remove in uh, some varieties, like uh, Syrah, the worse the uh, quality uh, gets, because the wines uh, tend to get out of uh, balance. Uh, they, as you open up uh, more space on the uh, vine, uh, secondaries uh, will push out. It'll uh, mutually uh, shade itself in uh, some of the varieties. So uh, that has to be uh, you know, uh, considered uh, very carefully if you're going to uh, move into that uh, direction. Con, and has rain any impact on when you decide to do any kind of mechanical um, maintenance? I mean, you need to be able to uh, get into the vineyard. That's uh, a logistics uh, issue. I mean, okay. I mean, uh, these are uh, heavy machines. I mean, uh, we've seen them, uh, you know, sink all the way down to the uh, axles on a uh, central coast. But I mean, other than that, I mean, I I don't know uh, anything uh, that would uh, hold people back from uh, mechanically uh, doing anything uh, during rain. Well, typically, you know, uh, any rain event, Maybe during the growing season too, you will get release spore releases from some of the trunk disease organisms. And so, yeah, ideally, true. if you're making wounds, which even a suckering wound makes a small opening there, I mean, you always have a small chance of uh, increased infection versus doing that in dry weather. And that's true with anything. With graft vines, yeah. uh, if you get rain and you've got open wounds, you're going to get an increased chance of potentially getting some infections. It's a very low, much lower spore load, but it still happens. Any rain event will cause a spore release. Okay, okay, so that is something to consider. So, I have one, I think we have six minutes and I will ask one question. Okay, I'm gonna make a comment. This is as a non-viticulturist, right? So Khan, you mentioned that there is no reason to drop the fruit. Say so you didn't harvest, there's no reason to drop the fruit before the next harvest, right? But last year I was still in a meeting where they were talking about crop insurance and the need to drop the fruit and whether that gets covered by crop insurance or not. Uh, I'd have to ask my wife. It's a perception wife. thing. <laughs> I'd have to ask my wife. That seems like a, you know, a legalese, but, uh, uh, Actually, uh, uh, our uh, grapevine uh, pathologist uh, wrote a nice uh, article with Rhonda Smith about the uh, uh, reason not to drop fruit. And, okay. uh, but I don't know how it will play with uh, crop uh, insurance in this case. Larry, have you heard anything about it? Because I think in this meeting it was a concern because they didn't cover all that extra labor and didn't put it in their formula that they use. But it seems now perhaps that is not the end of the world if it really isn't necessary to do it in the first place. But it seemed like people in that meeting thought that it's a necessary, um, you know, practice. No, it's not a necessary practice. I mean, like, because... Okay. Uh, I mean, even if you are uh, bringing a harvester to uh, dump the fruit into the uh, next row, I mean, it's an uh, extra burden. Um, yes. We okay. haven't seen uh, any benefit of uh, removing the uh, crop. So. So, Con, in your, in your PowerPoint, you mentioned something about, say you want to sort of try and mothball your vineyard and do as minimum input cost as possible. You mentioned a minimum amount of water that you still need to add, and then that you need to do at least your sulfur sprays. Is there anything else you need to do? Um, I mean, pay your taxes. <laughs> I mean, those are the uh, minimal practices uh, that people would have to do. I mean, uh, in a normal, uh, uh, under normal operating uh, circumstances, uh, we would uh, put on at least uh, two acre feet of water, anything uh, less than that, uh, you know, yields uh, would start declining. But, uh, you know, North Coast, like uh, uh, Napa, Oakville, I mean, irrigation is, you know, a recent uh, phenomenon. I mean, when I say recent, like uh, 35 years, uh, it may not even be uh, needed uh, if you're a uh, mothballing vineyards, but uh, I don't know anyone that's mothballing in uh, Napa. 
uh, in a Lodi Galt area, if you're, uh, you know, going to mothball it, because people can't get down to, uh, you know, uh, bare minimums uh, with the uh, practices uh, that we have uh, mentioned. Uh, one thing uh, that's of, uh, you know, uh, interest is, uh, you know, uh, vine mealy by if uh, ebbs and uh, flows, uh, you know, the uh, infection or uh, infestation uh, herbivore uh, by uh, vine mealy bugs. So uh, if that is a concern, uh, I would be uh, watching out for the, uh, you know, uh, sticky cards uh, to do the, uh, you know, uh, uh, admire uh, drips or uh, movento uh, drips, if that is uh, of uh, concern. But then again, uh, you know, if you're not selling the uh, fruit, so I don't know uh, if you can, uh, you know, there's not enough information uh, out there uh, to uh, say, uh, you know, skip the uh, Movento or uh, admire uh, drip. So, Con, there's a there's a question in chat about what what you mean by mothballing, and I, I think you know you can expand a little bit on that in terms of what what are the goals that you would see if someone wanted to temporarily not use their vineyard. Yeah, I mean, uh, mothballing is a term uh, that growers uh, affectionately say, uh, you know, not producing. Uh, so they will uh, have uh, lost their uh, contract uh, with a winery. Uh, there's no buyer for their uh, fruit. They're not going to uh, produce uh, fruit for uh, commercial uh, purposes. So they're going to uh, do the uh, minimum amount of uh, management to keep the uh, plants alive. And then uh, with the hopes that uh, they'll pick up a contract uh, in the upcoming years to uh, sell the fruit or uh, make the wine out uh, themselves uh, in the uh, future. That's what I, that's what I mean by uh, mothballing. So Larry, did you, I, I saw at some point you had, might've had a comment. Was, was there something that you wanted to add along the way? Yeah, you know, I've seen vineyards mothball before. I agree with Con. You can do, you do have to do some minimum things. So one, the canopies have to remain somewhat healthy or active to avoid any negative effects, you know, uh, late season. Again, there are some pest situations. I mean, it also depends if you have production blocks that you're actually know you're gonna produce and some that aren't. I mean, you have to control powdery mildew, otherwise that block becomes a nursery for spores for the, the, the ones that you are producing from. And uh, I would agree that, that there's no negative consequence of having that crop, although when you have those berries and if it's a very heavy crop, it, it is, t if you're hand pruning, it's, it's, it does cost more money to prune those vines, but it, it's, it probably doesn't still, you know, the fact that you would go in there and drop crop with a machine, uh, even with a machine just to, to clean it up, it probably doesn't justify that expense, but it, it will increase your pruning costs if you're hand pruning. If you're if you're uh, machine pruning it, which oftentimes I've seen mothballed vineyards where they just hedge it, and then either they stay with the hedging or they come back in and hand prune, you end up with a very large bill to, to bring those things back if you want to hand prune them in, in, in the future. And sometimes you do have some loss of productivity because you're cutting off all the, the one-year-old wood to kind of get them back into shape. And so there are some negative consequences. Because there's some positive things too. I mean, if you have uh, blocks with problems, like we said earlier, you could uh, cut them back and retrain them and you will eliminate uh, things like trunk diseases. I think you also have to think about, is that block a, a block that has leaf roll virus and, and, and mealybugs? And so you have to do some controls there unless you want that block then to become a source for infection to other vineyards adjacent to that block. So you have to kind of think about the pests too. And, I know in the 80s, uh, there was abandoned vineyards in the Central Valley, and there was also, it's when we got uh, variegated leafhopper, and so some of those uh, blocks, people didn't do anything, and mid-season, they got torched by heavy uh, leafhopper populations. So that would be somewhat negative, too, if you, your vines prematurely defoliated from excessive uh, damage from an insect pest. So some of those things would have to be treated if you don't want to have a negative consequence of some of those pest situations. That makes sense. Ooh. Well, it's one minute past three, according to my computer. And I would like to thank um, both Khan and Larry for spending the time with us and supporting Office Hours with Dave and Anita. We really appreciate it. Um, but. Dave and I don't have to do all the talking. That's always a relief. <laughs> and I would like to thank all our attendees. 
for spending time with us. It's really great for us to interact with the industry and actually see some of your faces weekly. Um, um, I don't know. Um, I would like to say have a good week. I hope you have a good air conditioning and don't have to spend too much time in the hot sun in the vineyard. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> no. No, uh, thanks, Larry. Okay. I don't know if Dave we'll wants to add something. Next week. Okay, hope to see you all next week. Bye. Bye.